Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us on today's webinar, Fundamentals of Contractors Pollution Insurance with Propel Insurance and Synapse. Just a few housekeeping items before we get started. If you called in via audio, we encourage you to join us on another device so you can view the presentation if you're able to. All attendees are muted to ensure audio quality throughout today's presentation. If you have a question, please use the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen, and time permitting, we'll get to as many questions as possible later on in the presentation. Also, this event is being recorded, and the recording will be made available on Alera Group website, as well as the Propel Insurance website as soon as it becomes available. We have with us today, Sharnell Devona, Account Executive of Commercial Construction at Propel Insurance with introductions. Again, thank you for joining us today. Now let's get started. Sharnell, it's all yours. Well, thank you, Grace, and good morning or good afternoon, as the case may be. Yes, I am Sharnell Devona, and I welcome you to our Contractors Pollution presentation. I'd like to introduce our presenters today, Dave Haverkamp and Robert Potter, both from Synapse Services, LLC. Dave leads the Mountain Central region of SNAP Services and brings 25 years of experience in the environmental insurance business. Dave started his career in underwriting at AIG and prior to joining Synapse in 2012, served as the Vice President of Aspen's Specialty as their National Product Line Specialist for the Contractors Pollution and Professional Products. Robert leads the West Coast region of Synapse Services and has over 25 years of experience in the environmental industry. Robert has spent four years in has spent four years in environmental consulting and 22 years in various capacities of environmental underwriting. Prior to joining Synapse, Robert served as the national underwriting manager for Sirius International Insurance Company's environmental division, where he led a team of experienced underwriters across all product lines. Over to you, Dave. Thanks, Chanel. All right, we'll go to the next slide. All right, well, that's, that's a little bit about Robert and me, but uh, I'll give you a little bit about Synapse uh, and the company we work for. We're, we're a specialty wholesale broker that uh, focuses on primarily the pollution and professional liability sectors. We aren't generalists. We work in this space every day. So we eat, breathe, and sleep pollution and professional liability. We've also got a really robust team behind us. So besides ourselves, we've got, we're about 100 strong. And a lot of the uh, individuals have similar backgrounds to Robert and me. Um, we also have uh, in-house legal counsel uh, and environmental engineers on staff that support us, uh, that allows us to stay on the cutting edge of uh, uh, any developments in the industry and, and the trends and to uh, always be thinking ahead uh, as far as the risks are concerned in this space. So we're not generalists, this is all we do. Um, so I thought it'd be a good, opportunity to let you know that uh, uh, this is our background. So Robert will start in on the first slide and I'll jump back in later. Great, thanks Dave. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So why is it that people are buying this line of insurance? Why are people spending money on a line of insurance that is oftentimes not considered to be compulsory? Um, it's really, it's good risk management. It's good balance sheet protection. And the types of claims we're going to talk about today, they don't happen frequently, but when they do happen, they tend to be very severe. Um, and so you don't want to have an unexpected seven-figure hit uh, to your balance sheet in the construction industry where margins are already fairly thin. Um, a lot of times for contractors, the first time they ever buy this insurance, it's because they're contractually obligated to do so. They're entering into some kind of a project where the owner is asking them to bring pollution and or professional insurance to the project. That being said, this is really sticky line of insurance. Once people buy it, even if they're no longer contractually obligated to carry it, they generally carry it in perpetuity. Um, and the reason for that is it provides a lot of coverage for a really reasonable amount of premium. And it closes a lot of gaps that are left behind in the uh, property and casualty policies. And once people really realize what they're getting and how much they're spending on it, they tend to really like that insurance and carry it forever. Um, you know, for contractors, there's a lot of different types of exposures in the industry that, that they should be aware of. And anytime you're breaking the ground, you run the risk of exacerbating an existing pollution condition or encountering some type of subsurface structure. But what's been driving the industry for the last 20 plus years is, is mold. Uh, there's been a lot of mold claims, so it's driving the claims uh, 
as well. And so if you're entering into a project, say you build it, there's a construction defect which allows water to get in and that leads to mold. These policies respond to all the different aspects of the mold claims and uh, really results from these mold exclusions being added to the general liability policies right around the, uh, the turn of the century. Um, it works really well for fixed facilities too, so owned or operated locations. I like to tell people if you're transacting a piece of real estate, either through a merger and acquisition or just a real estate transaction, you're entering into the chain of title on that property. Therefore, you're entering into the RICRA chain of liability, could potentially be held responsible for pollution conditions which arose before you even bought the property. It works really well for operation, operational risks on a site as well. So covering you for mold in an apartment complex, covering you from emissions from a manufacturing site. All of these things can kind of get rolled into one on a site liability policy. Uh, next slide, please. So we talked a little bit about why people buy this insurance. Well, what exactly are they buying? What kind of product lines are available? You can see there's a variety of products here. We will talk in more detail about most of these today, uh, but the product line that you need is dependent upon the industry in which you operate and the risk you're really looking to get covered. So in construction, the, the base policy we work with most commonly is contractor's pollution liability or CPL, covering you for any kind of pollution condition arising out of your contracting services. Uh, that can also be combined with professional liability, a lot more bang for the buck on that product and uh, give you a contractor's pollution and professional policy. For certain classes of business, we can even add in the GL on that for a true packaged approach for GL pollution and professional all rolled into one. And then on the site liability side, really just about any kind of site you can imagine can be covered. Um, but for anyone who's doing anything in manufacturing and or distribution, you can also add in the general liability on that for another packaged approach. That's a little outside the scope of what we're gonna talk about today, but if anybody's working with manufacturers or distributors, it's, it's worth asking a little bit about that product line. Um, now we can talk a little bit more about some specifics of uh, next slide, please. Um, so we'll start off with the contractor's pollution liability, CPL policy. Again, I mentioned that's kind of the base policy that we work with. It's the broadest, uh, I mean, it's the covers you any kind of pollution condition arising from your contracting services. So if you're out there doing construction and you create a pollution condition, this policy is designed to respond. It's pretty available for just about any class in the industry. There's over 40 carriers doing this. So somebody's going to have an appetite for whatever you're doing. Um, it's offered on a broad occurrence basis, usually, with certain risk classes being limited to claims made. Uh, but for the most part, it'll be offered on an occurrence basis. So how does this work? The policy will respond if you're out there doing some kind of contracting services and a pollution condition is caused. It responds with things like cleanup costs. So that could be first party discovery of cleanup costs, or it could be third party claims for cleanup costs. It also responds on bodily injury and property damage to third parties resulting from pollution. Now, there's some, there's some nuances to that on the property damage side. You want to make sure you're, you're getting natural resource damages included in that. Natural resources, also known as NRD, it can sometimes be the messiest, largest, and most difficult to quantify part of a pollution claim. So you want to make sure you're getting lots of coverage for that. Um, there's some ancillary coverages provided as well. There is non-owned disposal sites, also known as NODs. So if you're sending waste off to a landfill and that landfill turns into a Superfund site, the landfill owner is gonna go after everybody who ever sent waste to them. So you're gonna to wanna to make sure you've got coverage for defense costs, bodily injury, property damage, and third-party claims for cleanup on those landfills that turn into a Superfund site. Uh, you're gonna want transported cargo and waste liability as well, covering you for upset and overturns of your cargo or waste that are going to or from a job site. And then in all of these cases, you wanna make sure there's adequate defense costs on there. So defense can erode the limits of liability very quickly on some of these. Um, a lot of the carriers will offer defense outside of the limits of liability so that it doesn't erode the limits. That can be done on an unlimited basis with certain carriers or other carriers will either sublimit that or offer it up to the, uh, the aggregate limits of the policy. So you wanna definitely make sure you've got adequate defense costs on there as well. Now, this is normally written on a practice basis, meaning everything that you do as a contractor is covered for an annual period, sometimes longer, but almost always an annual period. It can also be written on a project specific basis. So you'll wanna make sure that the project term matches up with the policy term. 
and that you're offered a completed operations extension, which should match the statute of repose uh, in the state in which you are doing your construction. Um, those project policies, uh, they're really broad. They can offer coverage on a contractor's controlled or CSIT basis, on an owner's controlled or OSIT basis, or just a good old fashioned regular project specific contractor's pollution liability policy. Now, I mentioned this is the basic policy. It's pretty easy to place, but there's some nuances to coverage you want to make sure you're getting in there that you know require a little bit of expertise, someone to look at this to make sure you're getting everything you want. Um, I mentioned first party discovery of cleanup costs earlier. So if you create a pollution condition at a site, can you file a claim directly and trigger the policy or do you have to wait for a third party claim to trigger the policy? So that's an important distinction. You wanna make sure you're getting that first party discovery. Um, buyer on behalf language as well. You wanna make sure that your definition of contracting services is by you or on your behalf so you don't have to register subcontractors with the carrier. So that's that's it on that. I'm, I'm gonna talk about a couple of claims examples um, and one of which is another uh, aspect of nuanced coverage, which is, are you getting silt and sediment coverage on your policy? So we had a street and road contractor in the Northwest doing a project where they had to replace a parking lot asphalt. One day they ripped up all the asphalt of the old parking lot. And then overnight, there was a massive rain event that washed a bunch of dirt into um, an adjacent river. And you will find that anytime there's an environmental claim, there's always an adjacent river just to make things much messier. But that was the case here. And um, it's worth noting, this was not contaminated dirt, it was clean dirt, but too much of it actually smothered some of the flora and fauna uh, in the river and resulted in a $350,000 um, natural resource damage assessment. Um, unfortunately, this contractor did not carry pollution coverage. So they filed a claim against their GL policy. GL carrier denied it based on the pollutant exclusion. So they took them to court. Uh, the court upheld that sedimentation as a result of runoff is indeed a pollutant, and therefore the pollution exclusion applied. This was not a covered claim. Um, one other claim I can talk about is uh, we had a GC doing a big apartment complex in San Diego. Um, they hired a Gypcrete subcontractor to do floor leveling. And unfortunately, it was really extra humid in San Diego that week, and the Gypcrete failed to cure in the normal amount of time. They went ahead and they installed drywall and bathrooms and kitchens and all of that moisture whipped up into the walls and cabinetry and created a very moldy situation. Uh, $750,000 to remediate the situation. This was a covered claim. Uh, the owner had taken on an OSIP policy. So actually the GC and the Gypcrete contractor never even had to trigger their practice policies. They were able to rely on the owner's insurance on this one. Just a, a good example of a small problem gone pretty horribly wrong. Um, that's it on uh, contractors pollution. Turn over to Dave. Talk a little bit about adding professional to that. Perfect. All right. Next slide. All right. Contractor, contractors protective professional indemnity (CPPI). Um, this can be done standalone with professional or on a combined basis with the CPL that that Robert mentioned. Most of the time, it's combined. Um, but I'm not going to talk about that not to, to duplicate what Robert said, but everything that applies on the CPL would apply on the combined form CPPI policy um, as well. So I'll just touch on the professional uh, portion of this coverage. Uh, that acronym CPPI, it's the most common acronym, but carriers use their own. It's CPRL, uh, CPP, and others use the PACE. Um, but this is the most common acronym you'll see or hear about, and it, uh, it's all talking about the same policy. Um, and it's uh, a combined professional with some first party uh, coverage features, which I'll touch on as well. Uh, it's different than other lines of business because it is claims made. Uh, the, the policy needs to be in place when the claim is made against you uh, versus occurrence on the general liability and the, the CPL. It also can be on an annual or, pro, uh, annual or project specific basis. Uh, it's a little more restrictive on the marketplace getting project specific. Some require that you already have an annual program in place to offer project specific, but, um, but there are markets that'll do it standalone, just not as many as you would in the, uh, the CPL space. Uh, and usually the extended reporting period is available up to the uh, statute of repose as well. Uh, so the professional policies cover professional services by you or on your behalf. Uh, 
that can be either defined broadly. A lot of markets will do it on a broad definition basis, which we always prefer, or some will require it to be scheduled. And if you're going to schedule your professional services, you need to be very careful to tailor those to what you actually do and that you don't vary outside that narrow definition. So when you have to define it, it becomes a bit of an art uh, to make sure that there's nothing that would be considered outside that scope that you do perform. Uh, so those are some of the things you need to look out for. But the once the definition of professional services is, is utilized, after that, the definition of damages is broad. So different than your general liability policy, uh, where it defines damages as bodily injury and property damage only. Professional policy damages are all economic damages. And this is where it's broader than other policies. You don't have to have physical damage to prove uh, what's covered. Uh, anything that re results in an economic damage to a third party, a financial damage is a, is a valid covered uh, damage under the policy. So we talked a lot about the GL policy. And, and how that's more limited, but uh, there's some limited coverage in the GL called construction means and methods, uh, which you typically get by endorsement. Uh, most, most policies do have, it provides a very limited amount of coverage there. This policy will be excess of that. The other insurance provision requires that the general liability policy respond first and deny coverage, and then you go to the professional liability policy. So a lot of people ask, why can't we make my professional policy primary? And that's just the way these, these work. Uh, they want to see the general liability respond first and then come to this policy second. But most of the time, it's clearly defined as an exclusion under the GL, and rarely do you have a lot of, a lot of fighting on that. But, uh, so let's talk about the target classes real quick. We have a few here listed, but generally speaking, you can buy this coverage for any type of contractor. It doesn't matter what you do. Uh, the coverage is available. It, um, there's some classes of contractors that just choose not to purchase it because they feel like they don't have the exposure. So that's more of the, the challenge is to talk about exposures versus what uh, carriers are willing to cover. But we did list a few there. Uh, I'll get into them a little bit more on, uh, on some claims examples, but um, virtually all clients uh, can, can purchase this coverage. So let me move over to some of the key features. I'm really gonna talk, as you'll see on the right, uh, there's, there's a bunch there listed there, but the first three are really professionally driven. The first coverage, professional liability, third-party claims, very, that's been the coverage around forever. Uh, the more recent uh, enhancements are the mitigation of damages and the first-party protective coverage. So I'm gonna spend a little more time on that because um, third-party professional is pretty self-explanatory, but there's a lot of confusion on the mitigation uh, and protective coverage sections. So mitigation of damages, also called rectification. Uh, those are used interchangeably, even though the, the terms are quite different. Um, mitigation and rectification. This is a first party trigger under the policy that does not require a claim from the owner. Uh, and to give you an example, uh, during the course of construction, uh, a design defect is discovered. No damage yet, and you're, the contractor is responsible to the owner to make sure it's, it's fixed. So that's a first party claim on the policy to keep the project moving and keep things being um, from, from turning into a real third party claim from the owner from uh, delays, et cetera. So that allows the contractor to proactively fix the design defect before the damage is, is, is discovered to keep the project moving and fix and move forward. That's usually a very high cost to do so. Um, and sometimes it's caused by a subcontractor subconsultant doesn't matter in this case for this coverage but let's let's move on to first party protective which sometimes gets confused with the first party rectification so same scenario but the damage was done by the subcontractor the subconsultant the general the uh, general contractor will make a claim against that subconsultant for damages to fix the problem but as most of you know, the design professionals carry lower limits, sometimes between one and five million. Uh, you also assume that those limits are fully available for the claim, and uh, many times they're not. Many times they're impaired by another claim uh, on another project. So this first party protective coverage is really an excess coverage to uh, backstop the inability to collect all of that from your subconsultant. 
And once the claim is made against the subconsultant and their insurance pays out, the difference uh, is paid by your policy as the contractor uh, on a first party basis as to reimburse you for costs you could not incur or not collect from the, uh, the subconsultant. So I've got a couple of claims examples actually about, uh, we've got, it used to be more rare that these coverage sections would be triggered. They used to be enhancements and ancillary coverages. Now they're, they're more the drivers of, uh, of claims. Uh, mitigation and rectification actually uh, have surpassed in dollar amounts, the third party claims uh, liability and uh, in the industry. And there's a good reason for that. More design build contracts, um, and a lot of contracts with incomplete design that start, you have a lot of problems during the construction, course of construction that need fixing before they even become a, a design defect after the fact. Um, so one example we have is during construction, the window specified by uh, the architect uh, for a high rise hotel was unable to withstand the high winds and prevent water intrusion. This actually applies to many scenarios whether it's the concrete mix or proper rebar, et cetera, that was not specified properly. Now, no damage result yet, but they have to be fixed to specifications. And that is uh, replacement, replacement of the windows in this case. Uh, and that's a first party incurred cost by the contractor. Um, we also have, there's one claim I'm working on right now, which is not resolved yet, but it has, I'm gonna mention it because it has a lot of, uh, different parties involved, finger pointing. Um, and that happens a lot in professional claims because finding the root cause of the claim uh, takes some time. And in the meantime, there has to be defense and uh, someone has to fix the problem and keep the project moving forward. But the one I'm working on right now involves a, uh, a distribution warehouse. It was uh, concrete tilt up construction, but it was built on fill. It was design build, but the owner secured the soils engineer themselves prior to bidding out the project. The uh, RGC client uh, hired the structural engineer. So soon after the, uh, so let me back up, the tenant was a flooring distributor to our uh, contractor's client. And soon after uh, operations, the floor began to settle and there became some structural cracks in the, in the, in the foundation, as well as the uh, uh, the roofing system started to uh, sink. So immediately um, there was finger pointing, but the owner made a claim against their soils engineer. RGC made a claim against the structural engineer that they hired as the design build contract. And um, the, D, the GL policy for our contractor is, is responding on that means and methods that I mentioned earlier, because it isn't determined yet that there was a structural engineering issue whether it was a geotechnical issue, but the flooring contract, the flooring distributor is incurring business interruption because they cannot occupy that part of the, uh, the warehouse. So the dollars are tick ticking up every day for loss of rents by the owner and our, uh, no one has been able to find a fix. So this is in excess of $10 million currently. And it looks like the geotechnical engineer has a $2 million limit, which is gonna be surpassed. And our contractor is gonna be most likely held uh, responsible for the remaining amount, even if it was a structural issue that uh, uh, their sub caused. So we're gonna see what happens with this, but it looks like it's gonna be a protective indemnity claim covered by the policy to reimburse them for the lack of insurance by their structural engineer. And the last claim I've got is, um, just a structural engineer hired by our GC client for a mixed use project. Um, they used incorrect code, which um, we see quite often resulting in just higher structural steel costs. This is after the structural steel was put in place. Uh, again, no damage here, just the design defect was already apparent. So it had to be replaced. Uh, it was another $5 million to replace the structural steel and the structural engineer has a $2 million limit. Uh, it was available, it wasn't impaired by another claim, but it paid the full $2 million claim and the additional 3 million was held by our, uh, our GC client, which was uh, covered as a first party protective uh, indemnity claim. Um, so that's all I've got on uh, CPPI. We can move on to the next slide for package GL and pollution liability. 
So luckily we've talked about all the coverages that get wrapped into this. Uh, and this is a really wonderful product. If you can wrap in your general liability and pollution and professional into one form, you eliminate a lot of uh, gaps in coverage and finger pointing between the coverage sections. You can eliminate multiple deductibles many times. And you can just assure that you've got one carrier responding to uh, the various types of claims, whether they're GL, pollution, or professional. And many times these carriers can include auto and uh, sometimes workers' compensation. Uh, the nuance here is that ha you have to be in the more in the environmental space, uh, and that's a more limited marketplace. So if you're a GC or a tra typical trade contractor, this doesn't quite fit. But if you are in more of the environmental space, restoration, emergency response, uh, the combining these uh, um, these coverages into one is a is a great great value. Um, but that's all I really need to talk about on that slide because everything else we talked about previously. Uh, and we'll move on to uh, EIL again for uh, and Robert will take this one. Yeah, thanks, Dave. <clears throat> so environmental impairment liability, also known as pollution legal liability or PLL. Um, it's kind of the godfather of environmental products. It was the first policy we started working with back in the 1980s uh, and resulted from the pollutant exclusions being added to property and casualty policies back then. Um, back in the day, it was very limited in coverage and was very, very expensive and was sort of applicable only to what I call the big bang industries, the refineries and pipelines and landfills, stuff that you think has a really high environmental exposure. Flash forward 40 years, with 40 plus carriers doing it. As you can imagine, the policies are much more robust in coverage. They cover just about any industry you can think about, and it's much, much more cost-effective than it was back in the day. Um, they're designed to pro provide coverage for pollution conditions that are on, at, under, or migrating from a fixed facility of some sort, and it will be deemed a covered location. Um, that is structured very similarly to the contractor's pollution liability, and that it's going to provide you with thing, uh, coverage for cleanup costs, both first party discovery as well as third party claims for bodily injury and property damage to third parties, again, including your natural resource damages um, and your non owned disposal sites and your transported cargo. There's some additional coverages that come with these types of policies. Um, business interruption is one. So if you have to shut down your facility because of a pollution condition on your facility or because of a pollution condition, at an adjacent facility that requires you to shut down, the policy will respond to your loss of rent or your loss of business income, uh, subject usually to a short waiting period of between three and five days, depending upon the exposure. Um, these are usually, there's also uh, coverage available for, for lending institutions. So the, the policies can be very broadly protective of mortgagees. If you've got a mortgagee who's a little concerned about lending on the property, they're usually automatically named insureds onto the policy. There's also some uh, first party diminished property value coverage that's available in certain cases on these policies. So if you go to sell your property that's worth $5 million and you find out you can only sell it for $3 million because there's a pollution condition on the site, that extra $2 million can be insured in, uh, in many situations. Uh, these are often written on a single site basis, just covering one fixed facility, but they can also be written on a portfolio basis where hundreds and hundreds of facilities can be written on one policy. Careful to note that all of those properties will share those limits. So you could potentially lose the limits for all of your properties based on a loss on one property. Now for contractors, usually the risk they're looking to insure is their yards, their maintenance facilities, where they store their equipment and, and, and products. Um, that can often be accomplished by adding coverage to their CPL or CPP policies that we talked about earlier. Um, coverage for those sites added to those policies is usually pretty limited. Um, it's sudden and accidental offsite only. Uh, with the right underwriting information, those policies can be enhanced to provide pretty broad coverage for sites as well. But if you're really looking to button down all of the risks for a site, maybe even including providing coverage for some historical conditions, a standalone uh, PLL policy is probably the way to go. Um, with regard to some claims examples, uh, we've got a couple of, uh, we've got, there's a ton of claims in this product line, but a couple of claims that are sort of relevant to the construction industry. Uh, we had a GC who was leasing a tilt-up warehouse space on a larger industrial park. Uh, they stored their vehicles there, did some maintenance and repairs and, and things like that. 
the landlord of the larger industrial park was informed by a state regulatory agency that there was groundwater contamination emanating from his site um, and impacting adjacent property owners. They did an investigation. They found that several of the tenants had been disposing of wastewater down the storm drain and that that wastewater contained contaminants which had gotten into the groundwater. Uh, so the landlord had to incur about one and a quarter million dollars to resolve all of these issues. Uh, they turned around and sued four of the tenants, uh, of which the GC was one. The GC denied the allegations, but unfortunately they lost in court and they were uh, required to pony up about 40% of the overall cleanup costs on that. And then just one final claim to talk about here. We had a, um, a waste oil tank at a contractor's own facility it was accidentally overfilled during a routine, a routine transfer of waste oil. Uh, it all went into the secondary containment as planned, but unfortunately somebody had left a valve open last time they cleaned the secondary containment out. So all of that waste oil flowed out onto the ground and yes, you guessed it, into the river that was right next to it. Uh, there was also a marina in that river, so there were boats and piers affected. There was a wetland, so there was natural resource damages, third-party claims for property damage to the boats, uh, cleanup costs for the boats, emergency response for the um, the oil slick on the water. All in all, it was a $3 million claim. Um, and uh, all of this as a result of just a relatively small overfill of a waste oil tank. Uh, this was a covered claim. The insured did have PLL coverage on their uh, practice policy, so it was a covered claim. But uh, it just kind of goes to show you, like I said in the beginning, these things don't happen often, but a small problem can turn into a really big claim very quickly uh, if you don't have the right protection. So I think that's really it on our various product lines. Um, turn it back over to you, Charnel, and we'll, we'll take any questions you guys have. Yes, yeah, so please um, do put your questions in the Q&A if you should have any questions for either Robert or Dave. Um, I'm not seeing anything there now, so please add any if you have any. One question that I had, um, Robert, and maybe you can address this, is sometimes we see policies that have, you know, like GL policies that may have some sort of sudden and accidental um, pollution give back coverage. What is the difference between the sudden and accidental give back that we see sometimes versus a full CPL policy? That's a good question. Um, couple of things. I mean, uh, on the sudden and accidental, you really are going to be limited to the discovery terms of that sudden accidental, however many days from the commencement of the pollution condition and however many days to report. So any kind of a gradual event or anything that falls outside of that time element uh, is not going to be covered. Um, and those can oftentimes be, you know, it takes a while to find those, especially your release begins on a Friday and everyone goes home for the weekend. And by the time they come back on a Monday, you've got a problem. Um, these policies are designed to cover a lot more than the third party liabilities on a GL policy as well. There's a lot of first party coverage on these policies. There's fines and penalties where allowable by law that is also covered. Uh, you've got the natural resource damages with all of the definitions that come with that and the fines and penalties along, along with that. So it's just much broader coverage, much more robust coverage for the contractor than what they provided by the SNA trigger on the GL. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dave, I'm going to direct this question to you. Um, the question is, and I'm going to rephrase it a little bit, um, is does professional liability typically or can it include coverage for faulty workmanship? Good question. Yeah, I can address that. So you may see most professional liability policies have a faulty work exclusion. Um, some will have some give backs. Um, for some subcontractor work and things like that, depending on the form. And most of the time, the, uh, the rectification mitigation coverage does not, uh, is not applicable to the faulty work exclusion. So there's a lot of give backs um, if it is faulty work, but there is faulty work, proactive faulty work coverage available. It's not built into anybody's form. Uh, Currently, there's only about three markets that will offer it. And uh, usually for a, a small additional premium, they wanna underwrite to it. And they typically tailor it towards the trade contractors more so than GCs, but uh, it is available. It's not built in. So you, you pretty much anything off the shelf, you gotta expect that you're gonna have a full faulty work exclusion.
with those with those minor give backs, but it is available um, in the marketplace. Some of the Berkeley and uh, CNA are two of the main ones that offer the coverage, and um, it uh, it can be purchased separately. So hopefully that answers that question. Thanks, Dave. Um, the questions ask if the this webinar is going to be available as a recording afterwards, and it will. It will be on the Alera website as well as the Propel website. Um, so we will have those available after I when they post it. it. Usually takes a day or so for that to be posted. So I'm not seeing. Oh, there's another question. Oh, not a question, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, seeing no other questions, I do want to thank Dave and Robert. Thank you very much for joining us today. We really appreciate you being here, taking the time to share your expertise and experiences. Um, and uh, if, uh, if anyone else has any questions, I'll stay here for just a minute or so because um, we do we have we're good on time. And thank you, Anita, for the nice comments. All righty. Well, thank you, everyone, um, for joining us today, and I hope that you found this webinar beneficial. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.